Um, I'm going to start off by telling you all a little bit about Rumble and why we started it. Right now, we're at a at a point in time where there is where where uh, where we lead really really busy lives, and also a large portion of our lives is our online identity. We're constantly wired through various portals like Facebook, be it Twitter, or be it emailing, be it be it SMS. We're always wired to our machines. While that is good in many ways and we get to know so many people because of that and we know people throughout the globe, at the same time we don't want to miss out on, on the, the essence of actually meeting somebody and actually physically interacting with somebody can, can be far more, um, it, it can leave a big impact and that is why we started Rumble so that we meet people who have extraordinary stories to tell, so that we meet people who have extraordinary ideas so that we can meet them and we can uh, we can listen to what they have to say and we can leave recharged and perhaps inspired and uh, inspiration brings me to introduce our first guest for rumble it is uh, mr arvind gupta <laughs> It's an honor to be uh, with so many young people. Uh, uh, well, before I talk about creative science, uh, children need to, before they understand a thing, they need to experiment. They need to touch, they need to feel, they need to taste, they need to smell, pull things apart, put them back again. They need to mess around with a lot of real stuff. They need to engage with the real world. It's not just the virtual world. And uh, there's a very, a very famous story from the life of uh, Maria Montessori. Maria Montessori was an educationist later, but she was the Italy's first medical lady doctor. And she ventured into education earlier. As a matter of fact, often a lot of energies to education are not brought by people in the education sector, but who come from outside. Because they bring a totally different experience to this. So after doing her medicine, she became interested in education. And she designed many teaching aids, which are still being used 100 years after she designed them. And there was a priest, she used to work in a slum in Italy. And there was a priest who was every Sunday, he would come and he was very fond of what Montessori was trying to do with poor children. And he was a good old Samaritan, so every Sunday after mass, he would bring some toffees, chocolates, and dispense it to the children. So one day when he came, Montessori took him to a corner where there was a girl playing with what is called as a post box, basically a a cubicle box with a little circle cut out and you children have to post a ball in that. Somewhere there would be a triangle and you slip in a prism inside that. A kind of puzzle which is still being used after so many years. And a little girl of four was deeply absorbed in trying to figure out which 3D object goes into which slot. And she wanted to just demonstrate the powers of concentration of a small child. So she asked the other children to make a circle and sing a song aloud to disturb her. But this girl didn't even look up. Because the joy of just discovering how this world works is so propelling. Montessori lifted her and put her on a table. And once again, this girl got lost into a puzzle. Which block goes into which slot? Uh, that day, this uh, priest uh, had got a box of biscuits. And he gave biscuits to her. And he gave this girl also a biscuit. She looked at it like this, and she put in the rectangular slot. So 100 years back, Montessori demonstrated that children don't learn through bribes. These mark sheets, these medals, these certificates are a bad substitute for the real joy of trying to discover the world. And children are new to the world. They want to learn how this world works. And that itself is so propelling that these are, these are very, very trivial things, which, you know, a gold star to a child <laughs> to make, to motivate. These are very bad substitutes for the real world. For many years, I've been, I've been fascinated with Montessori puzzles. Unfortunately, they're very expensive. I've been picking up old rubber slippers from the roadside. I think this is God's gift to education. Now, if these strap breaks, people just throw it away. If you just scrub it clean, it takes three minutes to cut this. This is with a, uh, with a cobbler's uh, uh, shoe knife. You know, four, 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 four little hammers and you just get it. The nice thing about it's white on one side, it's blue on the other side. 
that, and you can upturn this. So the blue sits on a white background. You don't need to paint it up. The white sits on a blue background. So it's, it's a nice, it's also a very nice toy for blind children. Because if you cut all these blocks in wood, then the sawdust comes out and they become very loose and they fall off. You need to put a backup plate, but not in rubber. So a blind child could actually just feel the outlines of this. So we, made, we landed up making about 40 toys or teaching aids just using the old rubber slipper. It's a very humble material. There's a book by Sudarshan Khanna called as The Joy of Making Indian Toys. He taught at the NID for 35 years. And the great thing he did was to collate, he would, he would inspire his students who came from all over the country to whenever they went on a midst vacation, uh, you know, go to your village, bring the local toys. Today, he has the largest collection of India's folk toys, and it's a salute to the genius of this country. Much before the Barbies and the He-Man, all these very sexist and violent toys made their debut, kids made their own toys. Now, this is, uh, this is a broomstick, a karata, a coconut broomstick. The poorest household would have it, a long one and a short one, and you tie them very tightly. Traditionally, children would tie a stone to this, but a stone can come off and hit someone in the eye. So if you just take a piece of rubber slipper, make a little hole over there, and you can just poke it. Now, if you just perch it in your finger, this becomes like the Sudarshan Chakra. <laughs> just like, a, you know, cent centrifugal force, centripetal force are very big words for children to understand. But here a child can get a feel of it. Now, something which, uh, which children like very much, this is a levitating pencil. Uh, you can see there is a, this is these ring magnets, which are very cheap, and they're available off the shelf. And they go into a pen or a pencil. So you put two magnets over here. Which way you put it doesn't matter. Then you take the, uh, another magnet and stick it. Now if it's sticking, it must be an opposite pole. One must be a north, the other must be a south. This is what you do. And this is how these uh, ones are put here. They are tracking. On the reverse, what you do is, first you stick this. So these are opposite poles, and then you flip it over. If you flip it over, they're similar poles, either north or south, and they repel each other. So the ones at the base are similar poles, so they're repelling each other. The ones in the front are opposite poles, they're attracting. So the ones at the back are repelling, and they lift the pencil up. And the ones in the front are pulling this. So if I just put my finger here, you can see that. I can actually, this pencil is hanging on my finger. And you know, I'm not praying to the Lord above. <laughs> And if you take an old CD, this is modern junk, old DVD, CD. This can be cut with the scissors very easily. Then you make a very nice levitating pencil. And if you can give it a little spin, it will keep spinning for a very long time. It's almost like a frictionless bearing. And something which costs about 15 rupees, 20 rupees for a child to make. In our center, uh, which is very close by, we must have made about 30,000. And ch children of class six, children of class seven, when they make a toy like this, you can see there is a great gleam in their eyes. Uh, they absolutely enthrall making a thing like that. Well, this is a very wonderful toy designed by my colleague Shivaji. And this is made from a piece of wire. You see this binding wire, which is used in construction purposes. You know, thick rods of steel are being wound together. This is binding wire, about two feet of this. Take a pencil and just wind it like a spring. Once you remove the spring, pull both the ends to make a spiral. And you just put two beads on the ends like stoppers. And these are cut pieces of straw. And just see what happens to them. <laughs> it's like liquid crystals. It's like a moving rainbow. All kinds of ways to describe this. It's something which costs less than a rupee, 50 paisa maybe. But it brings a joy to every child. Well, this is, uh, you make. Uh, this is one of those uh, little, little birds uh, where you, uh, it's a very traditional toy. You can see this little woodpecker come down in little small jerks, j just a little spring and a bicycle spoke. I'll show you one very nice experiment and uh, just uh, need my colleague's help for this. Now this is, uh, it's a, this is a long plastic tube. Before you make plastic bags, it's extruded into tubes and cut into pieces, and one side is sealed. This is how you get bags. You can buy them in long tubes, and in the end, we've just tied a knot. Now I'm going to keep this next to my mouth, take a deep lungful of breath, and just blow it in. 
This would be a good indicator of my lung capacity. So this is what happens. Well, an average person would have, you know, this is about, about a liter. It's about three, three and a half liters. You know, it's a very good approximation. <laughs> very nice experiment. The other thing which you can do is, earlier I put my mouth just next to the mouth of this bag. This time I'm going to keep it about 10 inches away. Again, take a lungful and then blow in. Will I get in more air or less air? Less. Now this is, this is a totally, it's a freaky experiment. <laughs> now. Look at that. It's a totally counterintuitive experiment. <laughs> And this is, this is, uh, this is what, uh, this is Bernoulli's at all its glory. This is what Bernoulli said. Air goes at a high velocity, it creates a low pressure zone over here. And all the air <laughs> sneaks in. And this is what's happening. Very amazing experiment. It was something which costs very little money. We're just going to show you uh, a very nice. Now this is what you do is, you take a bit of plastic tape, about three meters of it, and put it on the floor with the sticky side up. And then every two centimeters, you stick a straw. And then on the top of it, you put another sticky tape with the sticky side down. So these straws are essentially sandwiched between two lengths of tape. Now this is, if I just give it a little incident ray, okay, see, I get a message back. If I hold it tight, well, the transmission is very fast. If you hold it loose, it's very sloppy. You can see the velocity changes with the elasticity of the medium. And then what we can do is we can give it a few twists and you can see the water trough is, water crest is, water wavelength is in a certain length. What is the frequency? If we, if we, if we give it more twists, you can see that the frequency increases and the wavelength decreases. Very graphic accounts for a child in class 9 to class 10. And the nice thing is that, suppose if I give it a little signal, you can see that the, if you throw a little stone in water, you see these ever-expanding circles, but the water in the center is not going to that end. You're just nudging the water next, next door, which is nudging the water. This is how energy is transmitted. And you can actually see this over here, transmission energy. Extremely, of course, it's like a DNA helix. It's a very nice model, something which costs less than 10 rupees. Every single school could use it. You don't need to buy it off from a contractor, but the children could be inspired to make this. Well, in the end, just one last thing. <clears throat> and this is amazing. There's a girl, her name is Durga Jethi. If you are good, if you go to the university, on the university main gate, there's a Vidya Peet Shala. About 2000, run by the Karve Shikshan Sansta, 2,500 children work there. That's a neighborhood school, the only school inside the university. So we run a science club there. Three months back, they did a science exhibition. This has been designed by a girl, Durga. A poor girl, she actually washes the dishes in three houses before going to school. And this is what she made. It's a little bottle and you cut the bottom. So it's like essentially like a tube. We made a hole in the lid of the bottle and put a small turbine there. These are two safety pins and a small turbine. And this is what this model does. As you move the bottle, air is expelled. <laughs> and the expelled air moves the turbine. Oh, the, the very exceptional thing made by it. Uh, this is a gift from a girl, uh, not, not a design, but this is a gift from a girl from China. It's a, it's a little, this is made from a little cutout like this. And this is a little rat with a marble. And this is what you, you can fold this and just put a marble in the tummy, which is elliptical. So it's like a marble mouse, and this all of you must pick up one of these, and oh, this is such an amazing toy. <laughs> Very amazing. We have documented this, but all of you can pick up one of those. I think just in the end that children all over the world, they should be making their own toys, especially the poorest children. Whatever we do should impact the lives of the poor. That's how we enrich our own lives. And until children play, and, I have, and play is very serious business. You know, there is a lot of emphasis on, on, on curriculum and others, but play is very serious business. People make guns and make all kinds of weapons of mass destruction because they've had a very unhappy childhood. <laughs> if they had a happy childhood, no one would like to kill anyone else. 
So play is very serious business. I think only when every child on earth plays would there be peace on the world. Thank you so much. <laughs>